Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for all getting up so early to come um, talk. So everything I'm going to say today is either um, joint work with Michael Hull or joint work in progress with uh, Michael. OK, if I can't write the letter M, it's not going to go well. With Michael, Hull, and Hao Liang. So the other families is joint work with Michael Hull, and we have a paper on that um, on the archive from a while ago. And the joint in progress is the two three manifolds, so the three manifold groups. Um, but given the theme of the conference, I thought um, I might say something about the what we're trying to do, because it's about the family of three manifold groups. So um, I'll stick with Alan's notation. So let script oh, let M be the set of fundamental groups of compact three manifolds. Uh, I don't know if his were closed or not. It doesn't matter for what I'm talking about. OK, uh, so here's a question. And it was asked by Alan in a paper in, I think, 2002. And so this is going to be question one. And it says the following. So suppose I have a sequence Uh, of these groups. And suppose I have a, uh, a collection of maps from one to the next uh, epimorphisms. are the tau i eventually isomorphisms. OK, so that's, that's the question. Uh, here's question two, which is closely related. Uh, so this is um, essentially asked. Uh, in Kirby's problem list, um, and I'll explain what essentially means in just a second. So, uh, and so closely related to a question of Simon. So, and that question then is in this context. Um, Does there exist some number k, depending on the first one you chose, so that all but k of the tau i are isomorphisms? OK, so that's two questions. Uh, OK, so let me tell you a little bit about things that are known about these questions. I think these are very natural and compelling questions. Lots is known. I'm only going to give the, the briefest collection of things that are known about this. Um, so already uh, 
in the paper in which this was asked, Reed, Wang, and Zhu said, uh, yes, to question one, when the gamma i, so, I mean, there's lots of sub questions to this, what kind of three manifolds are there for the fundamental groups of? And I'll give you various things about, about that. So maybe I'll always, in the context of this question, have gamma i be the fundamental group of m i, and now, Let me check exactly what they proved. Uh, okay, so the MI are closed, aspherical, orientable, ciphered uh, fiber spaces. Uh, and they also uh, know to question two. Uh, for uh, the MI hyper closed hyperbolic. So they proved that there exists a hyperbolic three manifold M1, so that for every integer, positive integer N, there is a sequence of N epi proper epimorphisms to other closed three manifold groups. Okay, so the, I don't think they pointed out that they'd answered a question on Kirby's list when they did this, but. <laughs> um, so what am I supposed to say essentially? So actually question 112C uh, asks this for not groups. And then it says, well, remark, we could ask this for all three manifold groups and it seems reasonable, but not groups seems like a good place to start. So that's a remark after 112C on Kirby's list. Um, that one should ask it for all three manifolds, even though it's not quite asked there. So he, they didn't actually answer um, a problem on Kirby's list, they answered a remark to a problem on Kirby's list. So maybe that's not worth pointing out. Okay, but uh, in fact, the actual problem on Kirby's list about not groups was answered by, um, so, uh, by Agel and Liu, uh, 2012. And they proved that uh, if uh, gamma one is a not group, then it uh, pi one subjects only finitely many other not groups. Okay, so this was actually problem 112D on Kirby's list. So that's much stronger than number two uh, here. Not only are the length of chains bounded, there's only finitely many things that it subjects at all. Okay, um, that's not, I mean, question two is, is, is wrong uh, for three manifolds by, by this example of Reed, Wang, and Zhu. Um, but the, the, the finiteness of the collection of quotients is obviously wrong because there are three manifold groups that subject onto a non-abelian free group of rank two, say, and there's lots of three manifolds whose fundamental group are two generated. Okay, so, so the finiteness of the set of quotients is completely and ob utterly obviously wrong. This is a clever construction um, that's not so hard. Um, and again, the first one in their example uh, does subject a free group and that's how they build it and then the, the rest of the chains are arbitrarily long. Okay. Uh, right, and I wanted to mention two more results uh, that are known. So Liu in 2011, I think this is still a preprint, uh, says that if D is greater than zero, um, it's a similar sort of finiteness result. Uh, so any gamma in our class Pi one subjects only finitely many other elements of M. Okay, so obviously I better say something else because I just told you that this is obviously false. Uh, so what extra condition? So via uh, maps induced by degree D maps.
Okay, so take your hyperbolic three manifold and map it under a free group and then map it somewhere else. That's obviously a degree zero map. Okay, um, but if you take positive degree, for any given positive degree, there's only a finite collection of things that are pi one <laughs> quotients uh, via things that are induced by degree D maps between, between the three manifolds. Okay, so again, a very strong finiteness condition, even much stronger than two. Um, but doesn't tell you much about one uh, because we have to understand things that come from arbitrary homomorphisms and might, for example, factor through free groups. Okay. Okay, so the... Okay, so let me tell you one more um, result. So this, I guess, uh, was a paper by Soma in 2001, um, and what he says is yes to question one for hyperbolic. Okay, so this is actually it's a, it's a, it's a three-page paper and the content of it is about a paragraph and it's actually very easy and so I'd just like to prove it for you now because um, I think it's quite instructive if you haven't ever thought about, about this sort of thing before. So I'm going to suppose that we have uh, my maps uh, as follows um, and then I wonder Let Ri be the set of homomorphisms from gamma i into PSL to C. Okay, this is an affine algebraic set. And moreover, uh, I can take tau i and I can precompose it with it, and it gets me a map from Ri plus one uh, into. Ri. It's an injection because the map tau i is a surjection. So I'm just precomposing with the map tau i. So if I've got two maps from gamma i plus one into PSL2C that are different, then the map from gamma i to gamma i plus one into PSL2C, they're still different. So this is an injection. It's a proper inclusion of affine algebra. Well, it's an inclusion of affine algebraic sets. And if the kernel of uh, tau i is not one, then this inclusion is proper. After all, what would it mean for this to be a bijection? It would mean that every single map from gamma i into PSL2C factors through this quotient map tau i into gamma i plus one. But gamma i is a hyperbolic three manifold, so it admits a discrete and faithful representation. And so there's a representation with no kernel, and so it can't factor through something with a non-trivial kernel. So there are maps that are in here and not in here, namely the discrete faithful wrap of, of gamma i. So if um, the kernel is non-trivial and the inclusion is proper, but I've started with a, an affine algebraic set and I can't have an infinite descending sequence of proper containments of affine algebraic sets. So I'm done. Soma talks about the character variety, but it's the same proof, I think. Um, just... Okay, so uh, question one can be done in the case of hyperbolic guys. Uh, by the way, if we knew that there was one single group like SLNC for some n in which every single compact three manifold group had a faithful representation into SLNC, then question one would be easy for the class of all three manifold groups um, by exactly the same argument. Um, and I think that's an open question. There are three manifolds, individual ones that we don't yet, that we don't know whether or not they're linear, but it's absolutely possible that Maybe even SL4C is open. There's a, there's a faithful. 
Oh, OK, but five? <laughs> Yeah, OK, anyway, it's certainly possible that there exists an N so that every single compact three-manifold group has a faithful representation into SLNC. And then question one would be easy um, by exactly the same um, representation, by exactly the same proof as here, which is really not very long. OK, but that's probably, I mean, that, 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 that would be very surprising to me, and it's certainly not um, something we know. OK, so uh, great. So the project. Um, with Michael and Howe is to um, let G be a finitely generated group and um, study, so let G be a finitely generated group, period, study a set of all homomorphisms from G into the class M. So this is, if you like, just the disjoint union of the homomorphisms from G into gamma, okay? So this, I mean, this question one is a specific way, I mean, a specific collection of homomorphisms that you might be interested in. Starting at gamma one and going finitely far down this tower of things gives you a collection of homomorphisms to different three manifolds and you might want to understand it. But since, you might factor through a free group. It seems like to really understand maps between three manifold groups, you almost are forced to understand maps from arbitrary finitely generated groups into three manifold groups. So staying within the world of three manifold groups um, and just studying homomorphisms between, between those is not going to work. It's fine for degree, positive degree maps, and then, I mean, this is a great result of view, I like it a lot, um, but it's not, you're not gonna be able to deal with the general case without understanding the set of all maps from all finitely generated groups, or at least finitely presented, or at least free groups, or, or something. Um, okay, so we wanna understand such a thing. Uh, and the goal, one, one goal is to, is to answer question one positively, but we haven't done that yet. Okay, so that's, are there any questions? So I wanna tell you a little bit just about how I think about questions like this and a few things that might be useful in understanding this set. Right, so, uh, all right, so this is a strange thing, right? The set of homomorphisms, so gamma is a discrete group and G is a discrete grid and the set of homomorphisms from G into gamma is some countable set or possibly finite. Uh, and then I've just taken a disjoint union. So there's very, it seems like there's very little structure here, but I claim that there's actually a lot more structure um, than it might look. So let me try and, try and convince you about that, but I wanna uh, want to go a little, even a little more general. I, I stopped my domain group being a three manifold group. Now I'm gonna stop my targets being, a three manif being three manifold groups for a while and just <coughs> talk about general homomorphisms between groups. So let, um, G be a class of groups. Uh, and then what can one, well of course now we can't say anything about the set of homomorphisms from G to gamma, but there's various general things that we might want to do. So, um, suppose I have rho i, so, so and again G is going to be finitely generated. And suppose rho i is a set of groups G into gamma i uh, with gamma i in my class G. Yes, uh, the notation is perverse, I agree. Um, <laughs> in any number of ways, but. Okay, uh, so what? So I'm gonna pass to us, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume the following, uh, that uh, for any, G in G, either one, uh, G is not in the kernel for all but finitely many I. Or it is in the kernel for all but finitely many I. It doesn't bounce backwards and forwards infinitely often.
Okay, I can pass to a subsequence uh, for which this is true just by choosing a subsequence. I mean, look at my list of G's and choose a subsequence where one of these is true and then do it for all of my countably many elements of G and take a diagonal subsequence or something. Okay, so, um, so up to passing to subsequences, I can always assume this, and I, and I, I like sequences. So this is, I, I would call this a convergent sequence. And this set of homomorphisms is a nice compact space, I say, and every sequence has a convergent subsequence. All right, so, um, What I would call the stable kernel of row i is the set of elements of type 2. So those that eventually die, that's right, and uh, the limit of the sequence is a map, and it's a map from G onto L, which is by definition the quotient of G by this kernel. Okay. Um, and then L, L is called a, uh, a script G limit group. Okay, so that's the definition of a, of a G limit group. Uh, you, take a uh, you take a convergent sequence of homomorphisms and you factor out by the set of things that eventually die and you get a quotient of G. And that's a G limit group. And you get a quotient map as well. Um, let me remark that probably L is not an element of script G. Uh, Move that up. Oh, possibly, probably. Okay, so I'm, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, maybe I want to leave question one up. I'll leave Soma up for. Pardon? No, no, no. They're just homomorphisms. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. So I'm, I mean, I'm, I, that's right. I'm imagining I might have some three manifolds in the maps between them. Gamma Xi is just the image of my homomorphism, and it's not closed, so it's an epimorph. It's an epimorphism onto its image. So, yeah. So in my in my in my class, M is closed under taking subgroups. So it doesn't really matter if they're epimorphisms or not. Okay. Is there some more substantial objection? You don't look happy. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, so as Henry points out, it doesn't help to just study epimorphisms. You somehow want to study all homomorphisms. Okay, so I'm going to give you two examples. So script G is the class containing the integers. And G is Z squared and row I sends uh, one zero to one and zero one to I. It's not very hard to convince yourself that, the set, that any given element eventually doesn't die under this sequence. And so the stable kernel is trivial and L is G. <coughs> Which is not in the class, okay? So I just left the class that I was interested in by taking a limit, okay? So the set of homomorphisms to M maybe is not compact and I'm thinking about compactifying it by looking at the, the limit points under convergent sequences. All 
Okay, here's example two. Uh, I'm going to do it with a single group again. So the two, three, bounds lug solitar group. Get it right. Okay. And I'm going to take G to be the two, three, bounds lug solitar group. And I'm going to take phi to be the map that sends A to A squared and B to B. Okay, so as I'm sure you all know, phi is surjective, but not injective, because VS23 is non-Hopfian, and this is the homomorphism that verifies that. And I'm gonna take my rho i to be the powers of phi, the iterates of phi. So, so I learnt this, um, so an L, the quotient of BS23 by the stable kernel of these row i's uh, is solvable. It's abelian by cyclic. Uh, and it really doesn't have many homomorphisms to BS23 at all. I learnt this um, example <laughs> in a paper which has six authors. Uh, this is only a little bit of what they do, so I'm not going to write them up on the board. Um, so this is a paper by, uh, called Uniform Non-Amenability by um, Argent Saver, Borio, Lustig, Reeves, Short, and Ventura. Um, and they point this out uh, in order to give themselves an example of something I think that it is uh, non is non-uniformly non-amenable, and they're doing things with uniformly non-amenable groups. Okay, so it really doesn't have, I mean, not only is it not BS23, it really doesn't have many maps to BS23 at all. Some, but, but not many. Okay, so I think there's, in my mind, a sharp dividing line between different classes of groups, and it's going to give given by the concept the following concept, um, and it's a concept that guarantees that your limit groups uh, admit maps to your family that you're interested in, and it makes the study plausibly tractable. So let me give, so my class is called equationally Noetherian. Um, I don't think it's a very good term, but I'm stuck with it, just like Alan's genus that he's stuck with. Um, I mean, this is descriptive, I just think it's ugly. Um, <laughs> and no, yeah. Okay, so it's equationally Noetherian if what? Um, given any finitely generated group, there exists a finitely presented group, G0, and an epimorphism, uh, eta, from G0 to G, so that uh, my map induced on homomorphism sets, which is the same one as I just erased in Soma's proof. So what does it do? It takes homomorphisms from G into anywhere, in particular my class G, uh, to homomorphisms from G0 by, by pre-composition. So this, this is a bijection. I already told you it's an injection because the thing's an epimorphism, and it's the same reason as it was in, in the representation set. Uh, so what does this say for it to be a bijection? It says it's surjective, and so what that says is that, um, i.e. every alpha from G0 into G, so I'm at G0 and I have my map G and given by eta, 
And now I have over here this big class of groups. And I say every map alpha into script G already factors through the quotient map eta. Thanks, it's contravariant. <laughs> um, yeah, now you've got me worried, but I think I've got it right. Okay, uh, factors through eta. Is that supposed to be there? Exists a map, say alpha naught, or maybe alpha alpha bar. Okay. Okay, so why is this equationally Noetherian? Well, a homomorphism from G into some other group is given by, well, take, fix a generating set for G and work out where its image goes. And when is that a homomorphism? When the relators of G hold under that image, okay? So I'm gonna think of the generators of G as variables in my target groups, and the relations of G as equations that are supposed to hold, okay? And what this says is that every set of equations in finitely many variables is equivalent to a finite subset, okay? So it's like the, um, hence equationally Noetherian, okay? It's like the Hilbert basis theorem for equations over script G, uh, or curly G. Okay? Um, so I think, I think that this, this definition, I think, was first given by me and Michael in our paper, but many but people have thought about the ca these cases where it's a single group a lot, and I don't know who to attribute it to then. So let me give you some examples and some non-examples of equationally Noetherian things. Uh, let me just give you uh, an equivalent statement. Uh, Equivalently, uh, right, this family is equationally Noetherian uh, if and in fact only if every sequence rho i satisfying this condition here, these two things here, uh, eventually factors through the limit map. Okay, it's an exercise in like the first hours of thought about these sorts of things to see that these two things are the same. Um, and in particular, what this says is that if I now look at the factorization and the induced maps from L, I get a sequence of maps from L into G with trivial stable kernel. Because I, I mean, going to L, I factor out everything that eventually dies. In L, nothing eventually dies. So this condition builds a bunch of maps from the limit group to my family, um, G. And so, there's, there's, so I like this condition a lot. And if you can't do this, I don't think there's, there's much I'm gonna be able to say about the theory. Okay, and a group is equationally Noetherian if the cl class consisting of a single group, that single group is equationally Noetherian. <laughs> and we're raising our project. Okay, examples. Uh, well, so let's let G just be SLNC or any collection of subgroups of SLNC for some fixed N. Uh, this is example zero or maybe one. Uh, this is equationally Noetherian. And like I said, I mean, I already gave you the proof. It's this proof of Soma's theorem. I just, I didn't use anything about SL2C. Uh, yeah, or anything else where the, I mean, it's any, it's any ring where the Hilbert basis theorem holds. <laughs> I guess you can do whatever you like. Um, that's right, yeah, so much more general than C. That's right, but um, other things make me nervous. Um, yeah, so in particular, uh, any given finite group, uh, free groups, and so on. Uh, uh, this, I guess I should just say this property is closed 
and passing to subgroups. So if I knew that I had a family of things, all of which were embedded into some fixed linear group, then that family would be equationally in Ethereum. Uh, so three, this is due to Szilard in the torsion free case and Reinfeld and Weidman in the case with torsion. Uh, if gamma is hyperbolic, then the class consisting of the single group gamma is equationally in Ethereum. Um, so here, of course, it's, there are nonlinear hyperbolic groups, so you have to do something else. And indeed, Szilard does something else, and then Reinfeld and Weinbin do something similar but harder than what Szilard does to include torsion. Okay, so those are examples. I'll, maybe I'll add some more examples in a minute. Do I want to do exam more examples? Yeah, let me give you two more examples, and then I'll give you some non-examples. The classes that are not equationally in Ethereum. Um, and then so me and Michael prove that if uh, P is equationally in Ethereum and GP is relatively hyperbolic. Uh, then G is equationally in Ethereum. So if this, is the, this is the game where you take a statement known about hyperbolic things and you say if it's relatively hyperbolic relative to blah, where blah is something that holds for hyperbolic groups, then you prove blah for relatively hyperbolic, or relatively hyperbolic groups. So blah here is equationally in Ethereum. So this is the strongest possible theorem of this kind because of course if G is equationally in Ethereum, so is any class of its subgroups, and therefore this is necessary in order for it to be a for, for G to be equation in Ethereum, and we prove it sufficient. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll mention a corollary to that in, in a minute. And we proved, uh, and we proved another theorem. Um, of the, of, so if, um, well, it's a consequence of this, but let me just point it out. Um, so if G is equationally in Ethereum, um, then the class G star of all free products of elements of G is equationally in Ethereum. Okay, so of course each of these is hyperbolic relative to a collection of things in G. So that follows from this, but um, it's worth pointing that out. So Salah proved that if you take two equationally in Ethereum groups, the free product is equationally in Ethereum, and this sort of generalizes that to however many families you want to take. Okay, how am I doing? Okay, I'm doing okay. What am I doing? <coughs> So non-examples, so, uh, so the class of all finite groups is not equationally in Ethereum. Uh, neither is the class of all hyperbolic groups. Um, essentially because you can take infinite descending chains of proper quotients between hyperbolic groups by, say, taking, doing small cancellation theory or something. And if you want them to be linear, then do virtually special small cancellation theory. Um, so that won't help. Of course, how the, the, the linear group they're going into is changing as it goes down the sequence by example one over there. Okay. All right, so let me keep the definition in the example. So we're going to go over here.
um, I'm allowing, so he wants to take maps into A star B, where he understands A and B. I'm allowing maps into AI star BI, where AI and BI are things I understand. Okay. I mean, in fact, he considers the setting that I just said in, in, in the paper with Jaligo in the second one after that, but he doesn't prove that statement there. Well, maybe he could have done. But if I spent my life only doing things that Zalil Salah could not have done, <laughs> I wouldn't be much of him. I wouldn't be doing very much, I don't think. Okay. All right. Uh, there's many other interesting examples. Um, there's many other interesting results using sets of homomorphism and so on. Um, I think Salah proved some spectacular theorems about hyperbolic groups, um, even more spectacular than this by far, um, using this sort of approach that he takes. Um, and then there's various other approaches and other generalizations. And people in this room have many interesting results about these sorts of things. And you know who you are. <laughs> right, where am I? Theorem. I just erased question one, but not question two. Let me erase question two, because we know it's wrong. OK, so the, I'm going to call this a proposition. Um, once you've made the definition of the equation in the Ethereum family, the, this is something that's known, it's known how to prove. Um, by lots of people, and we and we did it. So if if we have an equationally Noetherian family, uh, and L i uh, limit groups over that family, then any sequence of epimorphisms between them eventually is isomorphisms. So So that will, you'll learn how to do that in your second hour of study of this subject. It's, it's not so much harder than the equivalence between those things. It's may, maybe a little harder. But. Oh, yeah, sorry. Well, that's, that's even easier. <laughs> yeah, you'll learn about that in your first five seconds of thinking about this. Right. Um, OK, let me point out uh, any finally generated subgroup of an element of G is a G limit group. So take the constant sequence of embeddings. Okay, so if I say I only want to think about G limit groups where G is my family of groups, I remain thinking about G while I do that. I've just added some extra groups to make my life easier. Um, and in particular, what this says is that uh, if G is equationally Noetherian, every element of G is Hopfian. In fact, every finitely generated subgroup of uh, an element of G is Hopfian. For otherwise, I could take just the powers of the in surjective, non-injective map, and their kernels are always getting bigger. OK, so non-Hopfian groups give you non-equationally Noetherian things. So that, that's another example there, BS23. So this, uh, if you don't like this statement about relatively hyperbolic groups, but you do like relatively hyperbolic groups, you could say that a corollary of this is if I take a collection of linear groups, a finite collection of linear groups, 
then something hyperbolic relative to that is Hopfian. Okay, so well, at least says nothing about the words equation in Noetherian in it. So maybe maybe you'll like it a bit more. Okay, so how are we doing? Right. So this work of Michael and mine that um, I've been mentioning, we were taking the class G to be a collection of universally acylindrically hyperbolic groups. So if you like acylindrical hyperbolic groups, you can take a single one, that will work, or you can take a family where all of the constants don't vary. Delta is fixed and the acylindricity functions are fixed. And then we study G limit groups over that. Um, but of course, Taking a free product of any two groups gives you something relatively hyperbolic or acylindrically hyperbolic. So you can't hope to prove that that family is equationally Noetherian because it's not. Um, and so the best you can hope for is these sorts of relative statements. If you start with small groups that you like, then the bigger groups um, you like as well. And that's the sort of thing that we're doing in that paper. And these are some of the things that come out of that. Okay, but we really are supposed to be talking about Three manifold groups. So that's the end of section one, generalities. Uh, so the, the goal theorem slash conjecture that's the work in progress with Howe and Michael is that M is equationally Noetherian. Um, and that would immediately imply a positive answer to the question I've just erased that was there, question one, so. Okay, so that's the goal theorem. Um, so are there any, are there any questions? So what I'm trying to show, let me just remind you what this means. Given any finitely generated group G, there exists a finitely presented G0 so that any homomorphism from G0 to any gamma in M factors through eta. Okay, that's a, that's a somewhat strange thing to say. So any finite, so any finitely generated group, I'm gonna, um, I'm going to look at all of the homomorphisms to all three manifold groups. And, I'm going to, and that's like saying over any collection of any three manifold groups, all of the tuples that satisfy all of the relations for G are exactly the same as those that satisfy only finitely many of those relations over all three manifold groups all at once. Okay? Well, that sounds completely ridiculous, but it appears to be true. And that's what we're working on. Okay. Uh, questions? Okay, I don't believe you. I think you have a question. If you have a finite collection for which you have the EN class, is the union also a Yeah. Yeah. So you can always find a common G0 have to find a common G0 for all classes. For the finite collection of classes. Yeah, so what you should be thinking is I have infinitely many equations and once I have finitely many of them, I've got all of them. So I just take the union of those finite collections for those finite sets, that's still a finite collection that suffices for all of them in, at the same time. So it's like I get finitely many G0 and then I take the common, the, the common quotient of all of them by adding all of the relations in this. Yeah. So definitely, yeah, so a finite union. So maybe that should have been example 1.5. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay, finite unions are, are fine. So exactly, you might want to think about your favorite classes and prove them one at a time. And Okay, so, and that's a good idea. Uh, so this result with Michael, and not very much messing around, uh, allows you to reduce to the um, aspherical and, and orientable case. So let me just say that. Uh, using the work with hull, it's labeled five on the board, and a bit of work. One can reduce to the oriented aspherical. Case. And if you're getting into the technicalities, you might want to make some other simplifications to what particular class of aspherical three manifolds you are going to want. And you, and so any property where you can say, I'm going to, every, every guy in my class has a thing of index at most k for some fixed k that has these nice properties, I could pass to that subgroup and think about only those. So that's how you get oriented. And if you want other properties, then you might be able to if you can pass to a double cover that satisfies them or something, a fixed cover that satisfies them, then you can do that too. Okay, uh, all right, closed, or, so oriented, aspherical. Doesn't have to be closed, um, but of course each of these embeds in a closed thing, so if you want to assume your target's closed, then it's not subjective if it was to start with, but it'll, it'll at least be closed if you want it to be. Okay, uh, it's also easy to deal with uh, geometric uh, three manifolds whose geometries are uh, E3 nil solve, uh, and we've already done H3. Is that my list of easy ones? Yes. Uh, if I take a geometric three manifold that's cyphered fibered with hyperbolic base orbifold, then that's fundamental group is linear. But I don't know that you can make them all linear in the same group. I think that's also open. Um, essentially you make them linear by unwrapping the orbifold and you might have to do that a lot and then you induce a representation. So the, the, the degree of the representation might have to go to infinity. So, uh, five spaces with hyperbolic base or before take some work. It's actually, I mean, the way I know how to do this, or essentially, I think the way we know how to do it, uh, takes quite a lot of work, actually. Um, and it's not three manifoldy kind of work. It's it's this equationally Noetherian kind of work. Um, but that's lucky because I don't think any of us know any three manifold topology. So, um, okay, so, right, the, so maybe the geometric case is not so hard, except this case, which maybe is manageable. Um, so then we should consider three manifolds with non-trivial JSJ. Uh, and as Alan pointed out, uh, there's a theorem of Wilton and Zaleski that uh, these the, the JSJ trees are for a cylindrical. And in fact, if you're prepared to pass to a double cover in advance, it's too acylindrical. Um, but that, that makes no never mind. And that puts it in the realm of things that happened in this paper with Michael about acylindrically hyperbolic groups. Um, a group acting acylindrically on a tree is um, acylindrically hyperbolic as long as the action is non-elementary. And the elementary case is, is um, very easy to deal with from this point of view. And the uniform acylindrically hyperbolic that I mentioned is covered by this four. 
Okay, that's that's the only that's the only thing you need to hold uniform in the case of acting on trees. Okay, so we don't have any theorems from our paper to apply to this situation, but we have a lot of tools, and and that's one of the things um, that we're going to get started with. Uh, working on the case with non-trivial JSJ. And the, real, and the hard case to worry about is the case where you have a sequence of homomorphisms. So now I've got a sequence of homomorphisms from my finitely generated group into, a, into groups gamma i, where gamma i are oriented a spherical three manifolds whose JSJ trees are non-trivial. And okay, so I can look at the actions of G on the tree, on this collection of trees, and I can take a limiting tree. Maybe these actions diverge in the space of trees and then I get a limiting action on an R tree. And then I'm happy, because uh, then I can channel my inner Zlil Salah and, um, and get to work. So the hard case is when those don't diverge, when they converge to a simplicial four a cylindrical action on a JSJ tree. And, if that's the case, well, then you want to build another hyperbolic space and take a, another and find some other hyperbolic space on which things do diverge and take another limiting action on another R tree and then, and then, and then continue to channel SLEAL um, and, then, and then work hard. And that's, and that's the approach um, that we're going to take. In the remaining two minutes, I don't think I'm going to tell you anything more useful about the approach. So I think I'll, I'll stop now and thanks for your time.